Hello, everybody. Welcome to the How to Use the Hip Hook webinar. I'm so excited that you're here. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes just to let everyone roll in. I know I'm, I'm right on time precisely at noon uh, for our little lunch and learn. Um, but as we're waiting for the rest of our attendees to arrive, I would love to learn a little bit more about you. And I'll share a little bit about myself, too. So the first thing that what I would love for you to do is get familiar with the chat feature on Demio. So you should be able to find in the upper right hand corner, which I think is over, over here, <laughs> um, your, the chat button and you can open that up and you can enter, just say a little hello, uh, maybe share where you're calling from um, or any little, little bits of hello to the group. That would be awesome. Awesome. Hi, Carol. Hi, Bobby. Hi, Anita. Chicago, that's my hometown. Awesome. Mike looks like he's from Chicago, too. Oh, looks like Jess has a friend, Jenny, who's, who's tuning in. Awesome, awesome. So the other thing I would love for you guys to get familiar with while we're waiting for more people to enroll is the polls feature. So this is a super fun thing where we can get to learn a little bit about what struggles you're having, kind of where you're coming from, because everyone who uses the hip hook has just an extremely wide variety of backgrounds, whether it's, you know, are you a professional athlete? Are you, you know, in your 70s just dealing with a hip replacement surgery and everywhere in between? So um, we created a little poll. It's which, which best describes you, and we're going to pop that up now so that you can go to the poll section and share a little bit about yourself there. Awesome, awesome. Hello, Aunt Marilee. My Aunt Marilee's on. <laughs> All right. So while we're waiting a little bit longer for everyone to do their poll and to, to tune in, um, I just want to share just a tidbit about myself. Um, many of you have already been following me on Instagram or YouTube or have seen my videos on the website. Um, but my name is Christine Koth. I'm a holistic physical therapist and I've been practicing physical therapy for over 20 years. Um, you know, over that period of time, I started to identify this pattern where tension in the hip flexor muscles, specifically the iliacus, was at the root of many conditions and dysfunctions that were going on in the body. And I actually started kind of noticing this my first year out of college working on someone with knee pain and recognizing that her pelvis was rotated, her iliacus was tight, and when I released the tension in her iliacus, her knee pain went away. And as a novice physical therapist right out of college, I was amazed at myself, you know, that I actually um, was able to help this person so profoundly with something that was so different from where her pain was. Um, and this kind of, you know, the curious mind in me <laughs> really uh, wanted to investigate why this was. So over the course of seeing hundreds and thousands of patients and seeing how this impacted various conditions from, you know, bursitis to arthritis to back problems to knee problems to foot problems. I started to identify this pattern, and that was really the birth of the book, Tight Hip Twisted Core, as well as the hip hook, among many other, other things. So I'm really excited to be here with you today. I know that many of you have purchased your hip hook, and you, know, you, you have it in hand, and you're using it, and you're trying to optimize the benefits of using it. Um, and you know, this is my life's work. This is something that I am just so passionate about, helping people understand this muscle and how it impacts the body. So having you here and being able to help you and support you is, is really like so absolutely rewarding. I just feel so grateful that you're here with me today. All right, so I'm just gonna take a peek at the polls here. It looks like um, we've got quite a few people with hip problems. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> 49, um, 49, 50 people, like almost half of the group here actually has hip issues. Um, a good quarter of you guys have back problems, uh, knee problems about 7%, 17% uh, pelvis and groin. That's a very common one. I've been doing lots of talks on that lately. Um, and some other places, you know, there's many other places that that can manifest for sure. 
if you guys haven't had a chance to do the poll, please feel free to continue to do that as we as we go on. All right, so I am going to um, start by just giving a little anatomy lesson because I think it's really important for you to understand this muscle and how it's impacting your body and really just kind of intimately know the iliacus. I'm sure that many of you didn't even know that you had an iliacus until you found the hip book. So let's talk just a minute about that. This is the handy dandy skeleton that you've probably seen before. Um, and if you're, if you're looking at your own body from the front, um, this is what the skeleton is trying to show. So if you took out all of your organs and your, your abdomen here, <clears throat> and you looked what was underneath, you would find the iliacus muscle, which is right here, and the psoas muscle. You can see that the psoas muscle attaches all the way up to the lumbar spine, the lower back, all the way up to where it actually matches with the thoracic spine or your, where your rib cage is. And so it's directly impacting the spine for sure, right? Because it's connecting right to that. And then we also have it going down here and kind of not necessarily blending with the iliacus because they're two separate muscles, but going alongside the iliacus. And here's that iliacus right in the inside surface of the pelvis. And both of these guys come down and they attach to your leg bone. This is your femur and it's right in the inside of your leg bone. This position right here, this point is the um, where you would find that on your body is your inner groin, like really kind of deep in your inner inner thigh. So you can imagine if these two muscles were holding some level of tension, how that would impact your body, right? Number one, these muscles are not small muscles. These are big muscles. <laughs> so if they're tight or they're holding tension at rest when, or when, you're, when they're not supposed to be on, they would be pulling on the bones, right? This psoas muscle would be pulling on your spine. It would be compressing your hip joint. The iliacus would be rotating your pelvic bone forward, and that rotation forward would impact how the ball of your hip fits into the socket. It would also be compressing your hip joint together. So, you know, if you imagine this being tight, it's like a rubber band, it would be pulling inward, which would push the ball of your hip joint into its socket, which would create more grinding for all of you that have hip problems, you know, and hip arthritis. I'm sure you're all raising your hands like, yeah, that's my problem. <laughs> um, and that happens over time. You know, many of us have tension in this muscle that we've developed at some point in our life and can be maintained for decades. You know, you could be walking around with tension in your iliacus for nearly all of your life and not really know it until some sort of symptom creeps up. So prevention, you know, obviously if we would have known that hindsight is 20, 20 um, but prevention really is the key. Um, and, and someday maybe uh, with more awareness around this muscle, we'll have less hip replacements and less torn labrums and all kinds of stuff. So I wanted to do another little poll here because one of the things that I've noticed in all these years of treating patients is that many people are aware of the psoas or maybe even had their psoas released or someone talked about their psoas, but very few people know about the iliacus. In fact, in all of my years of being a physical therapist, I've never had anyone come into my office, not once, that has said, oh yeah, I've had my iliacus worked on. So I'm going to put up this poll. It's um, about have you have you been doing a psoas release before the hip hook, and if, did you know much about the psoas prior to learning about the iliacus? So if you wouldn't mind sharing your opinion on that, I would love that. All right. <clears throat> so while you guys are, are filling out the poll, I just want to talk a little bit about why the iliacus gets tight. All of you are in, you know, different situations. Some of you are very tight overall. Some of you are very flexible. Some of you are have been, you know, embarking on athletic activities for for decades. Um, some of you have a lot of stress and tension, and all of these are really good reasons for why this muscle would decide to be tight. Muscle tension develops because the brain decides that it wants to protect a particular area. So you have to think about what kinds of situations would make 
your brain decide to hold tension in the iliacus and the psoas. So if you have, let's say, a hip joint that is really mobile, let's say you are very flexible, your joints are very flexible in general, you're probably really good at yoga, maybe you're a dancer, you're gonna tend to have muscle tension develop over time in this muscle because your brain is telling this muscle that it should hold tension to protect that joint because it's too loose. We wanna have a good balance between mobility and stability, and in this case, it needs to be tight. Another reason is that you are overusing that muscle. So if a muscle is like, okay, this is too much, you're, you're making me work too hard, then that would be another reason why tension would develop. And then lastly would be trauma. So it could be stress, like maybe you've had um, trauma, like sexual trauma, maybe emotional trauma, maybe even trauma, like surgical trauma. Anyone who's had any kind of surgery, you know, to your lower leg or your hip um, or your abdomen would definitely be a really good reason for your brain to say we want to protect this area that's been exposed to some trauma and to hold tension. It's just like when we, we all feel stressed and we all get super tight up in our neck, you know, it's that same kind of phenomenon. Once the brain decides that the muscle should be holding tension, it's just gonna do that, right? Its job is to protect you and keep you safe, and so that will, that will continue until that is reset, you know, until that is changed. So, you know, how many of you can relate to one of, one of those scenarios? Like, it's like everybody, right? We all have that. You know, sitting is another, you know, common phenomenon when we're sitting um, for a long period of time, we're holding that muscle for a long period of time and it gets tired and becomes tight in a shortened position. Okay, so I'm looking at the poll results now, super fun. Um, so 40% of you guys have had no idea that you even had a psoas. So, you know, you're in the, ili I have no iliacus, I have no psoas, I didn't even know I had that. Um, many of you have tried, there's 30% of you who tried different tools at home, and then you have about 32% of you that have actually had your psoas released. Um, so that's interesting information. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so I'm going to go on to next why the iliacus is so important, um, and you guys are probably already, you know, kind of know this to some degree for your own personal story. Um, but before I, I go on to that, I just wanted to let everyone know that I have tons of videos and information on YouTube, and I know that you're probably, you know, after this webinar, you might have additional questions. I'm gonna to try to answer as much of, of them as I can, um, but I do encourage you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We'll put a little box, a little pop-up here with the link to the YouTube channel where you can find more information after this webinar. Um, and by subscribing, whenever we upload a new video, um, or add some new content, you'll be notified on your email so you won't miss, because um, I continue to get more questions coming in and I'm continuing to make more and more videos. Um, so it's important that if you're interested in learning more that you do subscribe there. And if you want to minimize that box, you can, and you can do it at the end of the webinar, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone had that resource before we went on. All right. Oh, one more thing too. On the chat, if you guys have questions, I'm going to go through a bunch of stuff, but if you guys have questions that I'm not answering, feel free to type those in the chat as well, and we'll kind of collate those and keep those uh, for later. So why is the iliacus so important? When there's tension in the iliacus, it pulls the pelvis forward. So if you look at the body from the side, if you imagine this being tight and pulling like a, like a, a pulley, it's going to pull this pelvic bone forward. This is called an anterior rotation. When it gets pulled forward, you can imagine how it would strain this joint right here, which is your SI joint, your sacroiliac joint. It also twists your whole spine, so it puts stress on your facet joints, your nerves, your discs, and your lower back. This rotation also changes the alignment of the ball in the socket for the hip. So instead of the ball kind of fitting in the socket really well, when the pelvis rotates, it doesn't quite fit. It doesn't quite match up. So you can imagine that creating grinding over time, right? Could, could tear labrums, can irritate uh, the joint surface. 
The other thing that happens when that pelvis is rotated is because the ball doesn't fit well in the socket, it changes the whole orientation of how the leg works. So the leg actually rotates in, and then that causes strain on the inside of your knee. It makes it so your kneecap doesn't line up in its groove on your, fem your femur. It makes it so it pinches the outside of your knee. It causes your arch to pronate or flatten. It causes your toe to point inward, which eventually leads to bunions, and then can cause like compression inside the foot and all kinds of issues, plantar fasciitis, et cetera. And all of these things I talk about in my book. So if you haven't had an opportunity to read that, um, look for a free uh, little gift at the end of this webinar um, so that you can take a peek. So pretty important, would you say? <laughs> okay. So, um, there was, so I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I've gotten some questions that have come in through the form that we included on this invitation for the webinar. And I'm going to go through and try to answer as many of those as I can. So along this topic of alignment and whether or not, um, you know, how this impacts the, the alignment of the body, there was a question from Ashley and Anita about scoliosis. They both have scoliosis and they were wondering whether or not the hip hook would be helpful for them since they kind of already have scoliosis. So one of the main reasons that people end up developing scoliosis is because of tension in the psoas and the iliacus muscle. Because that creates that rotation, it rotates up the spine, you end up side bending and it creates that S curve. So a lot of people that have a functional scoliosis, which means that it can actually be straightened up if they're you know, like laying down, for example, or kind of untwisted, will absolutely benefit from the hip hook because the hip hook will be addressing the cause of that functional rotation. If you have kind of a scoliosis that is bound down and like the bones have started to fuse and it's not very mobile, the hip hook would also be beneficial in that situation because a lot of what happens with that asymmetry is that there will be tension, especially on one side versus the other. And that tension is gonna cause a lot of hip pain and, and knee pain. However, because that structure of the scoliosis is kind of, I would say like set in stone a little bit more, um, it's going to be something that would be more of a lifelong practice of releasing that tension so that your body is in best alignment and your legs are working at their best versus something that would be corrective, meaning you could do it for a while and you wouldn't have to do it anymore. So I hope that answers that question around scoliosis. I would actually love to learn a little bit more about what kinds of pain all of you are experiencing. So let's put up the poll about what is your primary pain. I had a question from um, Doreen who was asking about, um, can I use the hip hook after I've had a hip replacement surgery? And this is <laughs> the perfect time to use the hip hook. Um, you know, if only you knew about the hip, hip hook years before you even developed hip arthritis. But yes, Doreen, absolutely. Um, it's important, of course, that after any kind of surgery that your skin and your tissues have fully healed before pressing into anything. Um, but then after that period of time, it's, it would be wonderful. In fact, I treated many, many clients post hip surgery who really benefited from the hip hook on the iliacus and the psoas. And the reason, like I mentioned before, is there's a, that trauma that happens to that area of the body with the surgery. It's actually a pretty intense surgery. You know, they're yanking on you, pulling on you, muscles are being moved over. Your brain definitely says, I'm gonna protect this area. Um, and, and tension will absolutely develop. In fact, the people that have, um, difficulty with recovery after hip replacement surgery, oftentimes it is because the iliacus and the psoas are grabbing on for dear life. So um, every time people have a hip, hip replacement surgery, they should be giving out hip hooks, <laughs> um, or at least having the, their physical therapist work on those areas. All right, let's see what the poll said about primary pain. We got 25%, actually we already did that one. We missed a poll. 
I think the poll that we wanted to do first was the which best describes you. Um, so we already did that one, but that's okay. Um, okay, so then Doug was wondering about, I, you know, Doug just had a um, appendix surgery and he's wondering if he can use the hip hook while he still has staples. And the answer is no. Anytime you have an open wound or a wound that is still healing that has not fully fused, you should absolutely wait because you don't want to mess with the integrity of the skin. Even when I treat people in the office who've had any kind of surgery, you know, you want to be really gentle around that site where um, even pulling on something that's a little bit further away can, can make it so that it doesn't heal well or the scarring can be too intense, which, which you don't want. <laughs> you don't want things to get all glued together. So I would absolutely wait until the staples come out, until you've had probably maybe three weeks of having the staples out so that that area can make sure that it's fully healed before you start using the hip hook. And then Sarah was wondering about her torn labrum. She has a torn labrum on one side, um, but she seems to be tight on the other side. And she's wondering if she should do it on the side where she has a torn labrum. So again, when you use, when you have any kind of injury to a joint, your brain is going to tell that part of your body to protect it, you know, to keep it really safe. So in, in the example of a torn labrum, the brain is going to recognize something is not quite right in that joint and will create tension. Now, many of you maybe have had uh, labrum surgeries or have been told they have a torn labrum, have had an arthrogram and have had that data given to them. And it's important to know that you know, most of the population actually has torn labrums. And just because you have a torn labrum does not mean that that's the cause of your pain. I have treated many people who come in saying, I've got this labrum pain, it's in my groin, you know, it, it, it's really sore, you know, every time I do this, this, and this, it hurts. Um, and then once the iliacus is relaxed, that pain goes away. So it's important to do this discovery to kind of identify what is the actual cause of your pain. So yes, absolutely, you should do it on the side of the torn, the torn labrum. Um, oh, I'm seeing now that we got the pull up of which best describes you, seeing the answers come in. We've got about half of you guys that are athletic, like to run, cycle, dance. Um, about a third like to move around. And <laughs> and uh, it looks like 14, 13% of you are like me that aren't moving much these days. Um, we got the, the whole COVID-15 going on. Um, not moving around as much as, as we used to. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Okay, so then we have a question from Regina and Greg. They both have trochanteric bursitis and they're wondering if the hip hook would help with trochanteric, trochanteric bursitis. So I'm gonna show a little bit about how that works in the body. When you have tension in your iliacus and your psoas, and specifically your iliacus, again, remember it pulls the pelvis forward. And many of you did talk about glute tightness too, so this will help address that question as well. When the pelvis is pulled forward by the iliacus, the muscles in the back of the hip will tend to get tight because they're playing tug of war. You imagine these are pulling here and then the brain is saying, ah, oh, you know, I'm getting out of alignment and these ones will start pulling here. So you'll end up with secondary tightness in the back of your hip. And if you look at this, this right here is where the, tro the trochanteric bursitis would develop. It's right on that bone on the outside of your hip. So right on the outside of your hip, there's a bunch of these muscles that attach there. You've got your glute, you've got some muscles that aren't even on here, your tensor fascia lata, piriformis, your deep hip rotators. And all of these muscles tend to get tight one way or another as a result of tension here. And when I say tight, I mean that they're holding tension when they're not supposed to be could be sleeping, you could be brushing your teeth, you could be, you know, like not doing anything and they're, they're holding tension. So it's that chronic tension that's pulling. If you imagine, let's say this attachment here, if you imagine this pulling over time, pulling, 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 what is it gonna do? It's gonna be irritating its attachment point, irritating the bursa and irritating these structures right here. And that's actually how trochanteric bursitis develops, really. 
Um, and this is actually a very common phenomenon. I don't know how many of you actually have pain, you know, on the outside of your hip, you know, right here, right? Probably many of you have experienced that. So by releasing the tension in the iliacus, you're actually reducing the need for these muscles to play tug of war, which would in turn allow for that bursa to heal. So that's how that works. The answer is yes. Anne is asking, I have arthritis. One, one side of my hip it has severe arthritis. The other side has mild arthritis. Should I do it on the side that has more arthritis? Um, and this is a question that we'll get to a little bit later, but <clears throat> the, you, should, you should absolutely be doing the hip hook on both sides. You will find that probably one side is tighter, but it will change over time. So it's important to check in on both sides always. And even if you have, let's say in her case, she has severe on one side, mild on the other, we want to prevent the mild one from getting worse, absolutely. So you want to do that side. And of course, the severe one, the more that you release that tension, the less compression and alignment issue that there is in that joint, and that will make a big difference. So answer is both. <laughs> and then Krista is asking about herniations. She's got um, herniations in her spine as well as scoliosis. Um, you know, I talked about earlier how that psoas muscle comes up and attaches to the lumbar spine here. When that is pulling, it actually, some of the fibers of the psoas actually even attach to the disc. So it creates a rotation almost like a, let's see, almost like a twisting motion of the spine. So if you have a disc in between these two bones and they're twisted, it's like compressing that even more. So if you release the tension in the psoas, which is what you would re be releasing when you use the hip hook without the handle, and, and then work on the iliacus as well, it's gonna help not only align the spine so that it doesn't twist, but take that pulling pressure off of the psoas. Cindy was wondering about her hip dysplasia and whether or not she's got, she just feels super tight around her hip, like everything is like a rubber band just pulling on her hip, and she knows that she has hip dysplasia, which means that the ball doesn't fit very well in the socket, you know, kind of like a shallow socket. Um, that's a perfect example of too mobile. You know, you you don't have the bones aren't providing as much stability. The bone is more like this instead of like this, which means that the hip joint is kind of sloppy. You know, it's moving around more than it should. With that, that is going to make the muscles around the hip contract to help stabilize and keep everything in place, which over time would create constant tension in that muscle. So, and she also mentioned, it was interesting in her story that she was mentioning how stretching would help for a little while, but then in the afternoon she'd be all wobbly and she has a hard time moving. Um, and this is one of the things that um, is a soapbox for me <laughs> and something that I think that we really need to recognize that stretching oftentimes is not enough. Stretching helps to elongate and, and, and you know, kind of move the tissue through a range of motion and increase blood circulation, but it doesn't really change that much the, the brain's perception of whether or not to hold muscle tension. So that, um, that is something that is important. The stretching can feel kind of good at some point, um, but you really do need prolonged pressure to be able to release. And then Rose is wondering about pregnancy, whether she can use the hip hook during pregnancy. Um, that is definitely something that you should be absolutely cautious about. Uh, I have worked on people's iliacus in the office in a safe environment where I can feel exactly what is going on. Um, but during pregnancy, you always want to be uber, uber conservative, you know, and not press on anything that, 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 you, that you're not sure of. So I would ask you to go to your practitioner and check that out. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit more about the hip hook itself. Yay. <laughs> So um, let's do another poll here uh, to see how many of you have a hip hook but haven't used it yet. And um, let me grab the hip hook here. 
and just talk briefly about the design and then we're going to talk about how do you find the spot, how do you use it and all that. So the hip hook is designed so that it, when you lie on top of it or use it on the wall, that your pelvic bone, let's see, that your pelvic bone is your marker and that the hip hook actually is right inside the pelvic bone. So this you can see would put pressure right on the iliacus muscle and likely also the psoas muscle. It's designed to be super, to be placed very close to the bone. So not over here and all this area, but really close to the bone so that when you're lying on top of it, that it's, it, with just a little bit of a tip, it pushes on that bone where the iliacus lives. So this rotation is super important. Um, let's see, I think it was, uh, there was someone who asked about the strength of the hip hook. Will, will it withstand its, you know, of my whole body weight on top of the hip hook? It does look a bit like a very elegant, you know, just a fragile device, but it's not. And many of you that have used it know that you've been lying your, your whole body weight on top of it can throw it in your gym bag and it's, it's completely fine. And we do have a, a, a warranty. So if anything does happen, you just send it back and we'll, we'll replace it. I believe it's a one year, one year warranty. So absolutely will hold its weight. Um, it was designed because you using your fingers or practitioner using your fingers, you can't really get at that angle um, and be able to hold it for long enough with enough intensity. And all you really need to do is just a little teeny bit of pressure and hold that gently over time to get the intensity of pressure and the right angle of pressure that's necessary. Okay. So let's see. A couple of you are nervous about whether it's going to be painful. You see, I know that that is a big concern for a lot of people because many of us have never ever had any work done in this area of our body. I mean, even when you go get a massage, how often do we even work on our abdomen or inner thigh? You know, it's kind of an area that is taboo that we're not comfortable with. Um, but with time and with patience and being gentle with yourself, I think you'll discover that it's an area worth exploring. And many of you are concerned about whether or not you're doing it right. So we're gonna go over that. Okay. So let's talk about how to find the best spot. <clears throat> so when, when we were showing this, the, the um, skeleton here, you can see that the iliacus muscle is not a small muscle, right? It it's from the whole inside surface of your pelvic bone. So there's this bony land, landmark here, it's called your ASIS, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But if you go right inside there, you're kind of in the middle of the iliacus. There's iliacus above, you know, it is this like three inches maybe. And there's plenty of iliacus below here. This is a really juicy spot down here. Um, so there's lots to, absolutely lots to explore. So um, let me have Jess, come on in here so that I can show a little bit about how <laughs> I'm actually going to have you stand up first. Oh, okay. okay. So if you're using your own body, so why don't you just cross your arms. Okay? Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> if you put your hands on your own hips, so I'm going to be my, just his hands here, put your hands on your own hips and then you bring your fingertips towards the front of your hip you'll feel that bony part that sticks out. There'll be one point that's the mountain, the tip of the mountain, um, that is that ASIS bone that I was talking about. So if you move just slightly in from that bony spot, that's the spot where you're gonna to wanna to have the hip hook. Now some of you were asking, well, what if I have excess fat tissue? How do I find it? How do I get in there? We'll talk about the wall technique in a second. But another way to find the spot is to lie on your side. Again, finding the top of your pelvic bone here, sliding your fingers down the front, 
finding that little mountain tip and then right inside there. That's where you're going to be placing the hip hook. So bone here, right inside there. Now, if you go too close to the bone and you lie on top of it, it won't be able to sink deep. So you want to go just a teeny bit in, like maybe a centimeter in from the bone so that the tip can go all the way into your, into your hip. Jeff, I'm going to have you just stay there. Okay. <laughs> Let me see what other questions we had about the location. Russell was asking, well, I, it feels like when I lay in the hip hook, it just skips out. Like when I try to use the handle, it just flips over the bone. And this is a super common phenomenon for people that are very, very tight, which is a lot of us. So what can happen is that when you lie on top of the tip and you then start using the handle to rotate, that if you're not able to sink in very deep because it's so tight, muscles like taking up so much space, when you push on the handle, you'll just your the tip will just flip out, or you'll end up pushing on the tip here of the bone instead of the muscle. So what you need to do first is work on letting it sink in and just work on not using the handle, and then eventually um, you could start using the handle and get in there a little deeper. That's just a sign that you're tight, and the, and the wall technique will be great for for you as well. Um, Nancy was wondering about, well, I'm afraid I'm going to like poke something that's important, <laughs> like a blood vessel or a nerve. Um, and I will show in just a second a little bit about the, the femoral nerve. But um, the, you have all of your organs are here. They're definitely in the middle of your body. When you're near your bone going right here, you're way far away from them. Also, our organs are very slippery. So as soon as you touch them, they go and they pop out of the out of the way. So it's not, there's no issue around organs, pressing our organs. There are blood vessels and nerves that kind of travel along under the psoas, especially in this inguinal line, this femoral triangle it's called. So if you go too low, you might press on one of them. And that would create either a throbbing sensation if it's a blood vessel, or it's, you know, boom, 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 boom. If you feel that, stop, move it up a little bit or around, and you'll find a spot that doesn't do that. Similarly, if it's a nerve, you might feel a sensation. Let me have you stand back up just to show. So the nerve, so femoral nerve, I'll show a picture of it in, in a second. Actually, you guys want to pop up that picture of the femoral nerve um, on the screen. You can also demonstrate at the same time. But the femoral nerve um, is right inside, like deep inside the iliacus. <clears throat> and then there's this area, so you can see this is just as cre crease. This is where your hip bends. So anywhere below that or around that is getting in an area where you're more likely to press out a blood vessel or a nerve. But if you stay above that crease, so anywhere in here, here's that tip of the bone, all along this pelvic ridge here, all along this area. Here's her crease again. Here's the top of her pelvis. Here's the tip of her, of her ASIS. So anywhere in this region is fair game. You think of it like a little strip right here. <clears throat> okay. So let me just see. this. Let me show you just quickly the femoral nerve because there was a question also from Brenda who was having some tingling. So this, the femoral nerve goes right underneath the psoas and then goes, this is that crease, this is where your hip crease is right here. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor? Um, but you can see that, that, that diagonal line, or that's called the inguinal ligament, that's where that, the blood vessels and nerves come right through. So that's why I say, you know, doing it below this crease here is where you might have more chance of hitting that. And then, let's see. 
This reddish spot on this is called the effective area on this particular diagram, that is what people will experience in terms of a nerve sensation if they end up pressing on the femoral nerve. A femoral nerve can be pressed on because you're using the hip hook right on top of the nerve. If you feel any tingling down your leg while you're using it, stop. <laughs> Move the hip hook a millimeter or so in one direction or the other, and you'll be off of it. The nerve's super small. You know, if you end up pressing on it, it's like your lucky day, you know, if you found the jackpot, um, but you just need to move just a bit. Prolonged pressure on the nerve over a long period of time can cause that nerve to be angry at you and can lead to some nerve pain down your leg for, you know, a temporary amount of time. So definitely don't want to aggravate the nerve. Um, but the other phenomenon that will happen is there's a referral to that area, the same area, when you press on the iliacus, because the iliacus is a trigger point also and can refer pain there. So if it feels kind of like a dull ache, that's probably more a trigger point, but if it feels tingly, electric, like a nerve, that's when you know you need to move it. Okay, so we talked about the nerve. Do I just use it in one spot each day? There is so much real estate there. You can absolutely do it for a little while in one spot, move it down a little bit, move it up a little bit, rotate that, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, okay. So I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the wall technique. Now this isn't something that we, many of you probably got instruction manuals that did not have the wall technique in it. We do have new instruction manual and we have more videos explaining this, but it's something that I, that I realize is really an important part of you getting acquainted to using the hip hook. When you use it on the wall, you have the ability to see more of what's going on in that area of your body versus if you're on your stomach, you can't see what's going on, right? So, and it also allows you to modulate how much pressure and really kind of be more gentle or more intense and kind of get used to that whole area and that whole region of your body. Some people actually use it on the wall exclusively and never use it on your stomach. The benefit of using it on your stomach is that you can just rest and lay on it without having to be active. Um, but the wall technique has some pretty significant benefits like I mentioned. So we're gonna move over to the wall. See. So I don't have the setup right here to be able to um, show you the ideal situation. But in an ideal world, this would be a doorway. Okay, so imagine this area being open so that I can put my head through it. I can have my body fat going through the doorway. You know, I have like space here instead of this wall, right? Um, so if you have a, a, a spot in your house, like a corner of a, a room or a doorway would work great. The other thing with this technique is using um, like a gripper or something kind of sticky, like those, those things that you use to open up jars or, you know, to keep your carpet from moving. <laughs> because walls tend to be slippery and you can't like stick a yoga mat up on your wall to prevent that. So you can place it up against the wall, and it's nice because you can hold it with both hands. You can hold the handle, you can hold the base, and be able to move it up and down like this, and it feels more stable. Similarly, I'm going to tuck in my shirt here. <clears throat> Similarly, it's easier to kind of find the spot that we talked about. Here's your pelvic bone, fingers down, find the little tip right inside. That's where I want to place the hip hook. Right, and then I can go up to the wall. I can see it looking down, and I can see that it's flat onto the ground. I can lean into it however much I want to, so I can put my feet further away if I want to, put less pressure or more pressure into it using my body weight. So it's like this, and I'm showing you holding it with um, by the by the metal part by the counterweight you can just hold it you know hold it by the handle right um, but I wanted you to be able to see a little bit better 
So this is a way where you can explore the different parts of the hip, right? You can move it up a little bit, see what that feels like, move it down a little bit, and maybe even play with rotating it, right? Rotating the handle down a bit, seeing what that looks like when they move it up and down, until you find those juicy spots that feel like, oh, so good. <laughs> So from this position then, you can, once you find that spot that feels good, feels tight, you can let that kind of sink in. And then after a little while, you can push on the handle and let it pivot. This is where that, that, that grippy surface comes in handy because it, will, it can start to slide on a slippery wall. But I'm holding it, you know, you can hold that with your, with your hand to help prevent that. Another thing that can be useful is that the side that I'm doing, so I'm doing my left side, you can have this leg kind of hooked behind your other leg so that it's just hanging there and relax instead of using my, instead of standing on it, right? If I'm standing on it, I'm more active. If I let it just kind of hang there, sometimes that will help kind of get, get in there a little bit better. So all little tips. But this is a great way to kind of explore all these areas, right, along this bone and get used to the amount of pressure. For some people, it's so tight, and it's been tight for so long that it's so tender, right? And you only can tolerate just a teeny bit of pressure a day, and that's okay. I promise it'll get better. I remember. You know, I've had a tight iliacus, and I, you know, how am I supposed to work on myself, right? And I remember when I was creating the tool and really um, experimenting with various prototypes, how I would use it one day, and I was like, oh my God, so intense, you know? And then the next day I go to use it, and I'm like, I don't feel anything because my body had gotten used to releasing that tension. So trust me, over time it will get better. It might take months, you know, but it will get better over time. So just to review, um, having something a little bit sticky, being able to lean and modulate how much pressure. You could imagine if this area was a doorway, you know, my, my fat tissue can kind of go inside the doorway and pull my adipose tissue over so that this area is exposed, you know, with my, with my other hand, which will help me kind of access that spot a little bit easier. Um, and it will help, especially there was that the, um, comment about um, having, uh, having it flip out around the bone. This is a great technique to start with. In fact, I recommend really everybody starts with the wall technique because you'll find areas that you wouldn't necessarily find when you start with just lying on your stomach. Let me grab a little bit of water here. Okay, so next we're gonna to go to the lying on your stomach technique. This is the technique that most of you probably have tried. And I also wanna give you some tips on how to kind of decrease the intensity of that particular technique. So when you're going from the wall to lying on your stomach, that you can do that with ease. So Jess, I'm gonna have you lie down. Let's see, let's go look at my notes. I know Barbara, you were wondering about like having issues trying to get it flat, so we're going to talk about that. And also really highlighting the importance of having it close to the bone. If you look at this <laughs> skeleton, if I put the tip of this way far away from the bone, let's say here, instead of here, and I use the handle, it's going to ha I'm going to have to tip this, this thing a, a lot in order for it to get even closer to the iliacus, and it may not even get to the iliacus at all. So finding that magic spot where it's inside, just inside the pelvic bone, is very important to actually being able to access the, the iliacus. I had had a couple people reach out saying, you know, I pushed the handle all the way to the ground and I don't feel anything still. Well, it's because the pelvis isn't close enough. If you have the pelvis close enough, it doesn't take much, just a teeny bit of pushing in order for you to get at the, the iliacus. Okay.
So when you're lying on your side, you put your hands on your hips again to find where that bony part sticks up. Right there. And then you're going to hold the hip hook with your hand handle. Place that on that spot. Now, there was that question about whether or not to get the hip, how do you get the hip hook to go flat? When you roll over, you kind of have to hold the handle and kind of guide it in a way so that it does stay flat underneath and doesn't tip. By pulling up a little bit on the handle as you're lying on it will help prevent it from tipping. So say if you lie on top of it, depending on everyone's pelvises are different sizes and shapes, right? <laughs> So some people, depending on the angles of their pelvis, when they lie on it, it'll end up tipping a little bit. So if you hold on the handle and kind of pull it up this way, as you're lying upon it, that will help keep that aligned well. And again, there's always the wall technique too. So rolling over onto it, you can, from this position, you can adjust it a little bit. So remember when we talked about, there's a lot of real estate of the iliacus. You can move it up a little bit, so just, we'll just move it up, try that spot. You can move it down a little bit, you see how she's just kind of moving her hip up. You can move it in a teeny bit, maybe you're too close to the bone. But I find that that's oftentimes the case. Um, you can rotate it so that the handle is pointed down, which that's a very juicy spot for many people. <laughs> So once you're here in this position, you want to let it rest. You want your body to just sink into that, take some deep breaths, let that muscle tension and that psoas kind of release and relax before you start pressing on the handle. Because at first, it might be the first 30 seconds where it feels pretty, pretty intense and you want that to dissipate a bit. And again, if it's not sinking in deep enough, then it might be hard to actually get the iliacus. So then Jess can reach down, she can either put her arm like this flat and push down on the handle to get that rotation. She could grab it with her hand and push down either way. And the goal is to find that spot that feels, you know, like it hurts so good, like it's, it's been wanting to be touched for decades <laughs> um, and hold that pressure for longer than you think. And we'll talk about the, the length of pressure in just a minute. It's great. Okay. Now, Jess, maybe Jess just started, she started on the wall and she's feeling like, okay, I want to go, I think I'm up for going on the mat. It's maybe her first time going on the mat. She's unsure about the level of pressure. Some little tips <clears throat> that you can do is you can take a towel just place it over the tip. That will kind of um, soften the intensity of the tip. Um, eventually you'll want to get away from the towel because it is the density and the precision that really gets that, that relief that, you, that you're desiring. But to start, absolutely use a towel. You can also do a mountain climber. So just come towards me a little bit. You take this leg out like this. This exposes this part of your body and takes all the pressure off of this part of your body. Some of you might not have this range of motion. You don't have to go that high. It can be like this. <laughs> but when the hip hook is underneath you, you can see how this puts just a teeny bit of pressure on that. And you can graduate towards, okay, I'm going to go a little, little longer, a little longer, a little longer. So that's the mountain climber technique, which is a great way of kind of easing into the pressure. In fact, Jess could start, roll over this way. She could start, hold it, with her leg out like this, and then roll over. Yeah, and then be able to hold her hip up off, off, off of the, the ground with her knee. Okay. This is so much fun, so much information, so great. <laughs> okay, what should you feel? Um, some people have trigger points in their iliacus, which means that when they press on their iliacus, it refers a dull, achy sensation down their thigh. And that spot, I don't know if any of you ever had 
muscle tension in your neck or shoulders. And when you press on that muscle, it causes a headache. That's a trigger point. So when you feel that, it can have that sensation. Now, many of us can also have muscle tension without it being a trigger point. Muscle tension will feel kind of like a dull, achy sensation at the site where you're pressing, which might be a little less kind of intense as a trigger point. So I think it was um, Russell who was wondering about the difference between them. And, you know, we talked about earlier how there's a buzzing sensation, if you feel like a buzzing sensation or a throbbing sensation, it's a nerve or a blood vessel, so you want to make sure that you move um, after that. There's a lot of questions um, about can I do it too much, you know, how often should I do it, and all of that. <clears throat> so, you know, can I hurt myself if I do I think Stephanie was asking, can I hurt myself if I do it too much? You know, it's important that you ease into using the hip hook. This is something, an area of your body that has not been addressed your whole entire life. And, you know, many of you that are in your upper, upper ages, you know, it's like, that's a lot of years, right? Um, so be gentle and take your time. Now, once you get used to it and you're familiar with your body and, you know, you feel comfortable, you can absolutely increase the length of time that you do it. You know, if you want to do it longer than 90 seconds, sometimes I do it for five minutes at a time. But that's after getting used to it, right? You can also do it more often. You know, if like say you're feeling super tight that day, you want to do it two or three times that day, and you're comfortable, then absolutely you can do that. You cannot hurt yourself. Um, it is common to feel a little sore or bruised at the site of the hip hook. And if you do feel that and you want to continue to use it, you can. There's no harm in that. But I often encourage people to just take a break, you know, and not do it for, for a little while. Um, let's see. So that was with Kath, uh, Catherine's question. Um, you can absolutely do it twice a day, Seisha. Lisa was wondering, can I do it exercise right after I use the hip hook? And that is a perfect time to use the hip hook right before exercise because you get everything relaxed. It allows the hip flexor um, muscle to, um, to be its full strength. So if you're gonna go out for a run and it's nice and relaxed, the hip flexor is gonna be very happy. In fact, you might even notice you're even more sore after that because the muscle's actually working in the way that you want to. Similarly, if you're adding in other exercise methods, let's say a gasku, I know and Lisa, you're asking about that, other strengthening exercises, doing the hip hook first to get everything in alignment before you do those strengthening exercises is key. Um, okay, and then, Christina was wondering, um, her son was using the hip hook and was wondering if it was too aggressive, um, pre and post game routine, sounds like an athlete. Um, I've heard this story from, from my kids as well. Um, I mean, it's not something that we recommend using necessarily with children, although um, there are many that do. Um, doing it pregame is great. Um, even if you want to do it, you know, prior, like an hour or two prior to the game to get everything in alignment, that is great as well. Uh, it's an important point to address, especially, I mean, just imagine if we all had hip hooks when we were, you know, teenagers, we'd be so much better off. <laughs> so I would say, you know, using some of these techniques to decrease the amount of pressure, um, you know, it would be, would be useful in that situation. You know, and this is just, you know, the iliac is just one piece of the puzzle. It's a missing piece of the puzzle, something that's not being addressed, but it doesn't mean that that is the only thing that you should be doing. There's other things I talk about in my book, other exercises, um, you know, realignment exercise, um, and various techniques there, and there's many other exercises that can help to stabilize your hip. There's all kinds of resources online um, for that. So, so think of this as like the missing piece, but don't forget that there's other pieces of the puzzle as, as well. And I know Gareth was asking, you know, it was once a month. You know, you mentioned in one of our videos is that you, you only do it once a month. Yet, you know, once you get everything relaxed and your brain chills out, 
then you probably will only need it once a month. But until then, doing it more regularly is important. Okay. So I'm gonna do a little demonstration of using the hip hook. Um, just looking at the other questions that are here. There's a lot of questions about we could, we could do like a full day, <laughs> do a full day webinar, all these questions. So everyone who's writing in, I want you to know that if we don't get to your question today, that we'll absolutely create a video or share some information that we may already have that will help you to answer those particular questions. So I know we have a whole bunch of attendees here today. I know we have a bunch of questions that came in earlier. Um, I know that you guys probably have to all get back to work at some point if you're working, uh, but I do want you to know that um, we will get your questions answered and we'll probably be doing something like this again in the near future. Similarly, I want you to encourage you again to make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can get updates on when we post new videos um, and be kept in the loop that way. I think that was, is really important for those of you that are craving more information. You know, there, there is so much to share on this topic. Um, you know, I remember writing the book and having to kind of edit out lots of the, the parts that went into more depth. Um, you know, so, so we've actually been talking about delivering some courses that go more into depth into some of these, these concepts as well. So keep your eye out for that as well. Okay, so let me just do another demonstration here. <clears throat> Okay, let me tuck in my shirt so you guys can see. Okay. So here I am lying on my side. Here's the side of my hip where my trochanteric bursitis might live. Here's the top of my pelvic bone. When you put your hands on your hips, that's where that is. Bringing my fingers down. To the front of my hip, I feel this bony part that sticks out. I'm on my side, so all of my adipose tissue is just falling down here, so that's great. I have access to this area of my body, so I can feel it more. Find this little tip here, where it's at its peak. And then my fingers go slightly in, about a centimeter in, to where it gets soft and squishy. That's where the magic happens. And take my hip hook by the handle. I'm going to put the tip right in that spot, kind of almost like hooks under my pelvic bone, right? I can wiggle it in there a little bit. I want to make sure that when I roll onto my stomach that I keep the bottom flat. I got this nice hard floor with a nice thin yoga mat, so I'm not on a squishy surface, and it's nice and firm, but yet there's some traction here with the yoga mat. Slowly roll over, I'm a little cautious, so I'm gonna bend my knee a little bit so I can help modulate how much pressure goes in. I'm using the handle to make sure that it stays flat underneath my body. Slowly lowering myself onto the hip hook. Putting my head down so I don't have as much pressure. If I have my head up, there's more pressure. So I'm gonna rest my head. I can feel that it's flat underneath me. I'm going to take my hand off for a second and just let it sink into my body. I can start bringing my leg a little straighter if I feel confident, little by little. I can even go up on my toes if I'm feeling brave, feel what that feels like. Once I find that spot that feels pretty tight, I'm just going to rest. If I don't find the spot that's tight, if I'm like, hmm, I don't feel much, it may be that the iliacus is, is waiting for the handle to be pressed on, but it may be that I need to move it up a little bit or down. So I'm going to try it up a little. Try that. Can move it down a little. Not, not going past that groin line, right? We talked about that earlier. I'm going to actually rotate it a little downward. 
Ooh, yeah, this is a good spot. So take some nice deep breaths. Rest. Let my body sink into it. At first, it feels kind of intense, pretty intense. Um, I would say, oh, I'm starting to feel it relax a little bit. It's a little less intense than when it started. I can still feel it, though. Again, some nice deep breaths. 30 seconds is a long time. <laughs> you know, you may want to even set a timer or watch, your, you know, watch a stopwatch to see. It's been about 30 seconds, so I'm going to go ahead and push on the handle. Again, keeping my body on the hip hook. Gently push so I can feel it pushing on my iliacus now. And it feels different. It's a different sensation than what it was initially. Now I'm using my hand, which is, it's like my shoulder's a little bit awkward there. So I actually prefer to just rest my, my forearm on the hip hook because I can just completely relax that and I don't have to strain so much. But either way is fine. And then it's in this position that you want that 30 to 90 seconds to do the iliacus too. You can spend 90 seconds on the so as and 90 seconds on the iliacus to get both if you'd like. Nice deep breaths. And I'm going to release after that amount of time. Now, coming off the hip hook, when you first come off, it's going to be like, oh! <laughs> And it might be sore, but then it goes away in two seconds. So that's that. Now, the other thing that I wanted to, to share with you guys is um, I wanted to share a little bit about one leg being longer than the other and a leg length, leg length discrepancy, which side if I'm rotated one way. So a lot of that is what I talked about in the book. I know we're a little bit over um, our time, but are you? Is, there, is anyone interested in me talking a little bit about pelvic rotations and that sort of thing? Do you guys want to get a couple of people? Okay. So the gold standard for figuring out whether or not you have a pelvic rotation is the supine to sit test. This test is extremely hard to do on yourself. <laughs> and believe me, I'm like, how do I teach people how to do this on their, on their own? Because the leg length isn't a huge difference. It's not something that is very, like, very, very obvious in most people and hard to see on yourself. Like, really, it takes a practitioner or a partner to really identify which side is rotated. The other thing that I'll mention is that it's very possible that your rotation will change over time. Now, most people, it stays the same. Like if you've got a right anterior rotation, it's the same, you know, for most of your life. It's your pattern that you've, that you've developed. But for some people, they work on it, they release the tension, they do the realignment exercise I talk about in the book, and then um, their other side gets rotated. <laughs> and this, you know, we have to remember that our pelvis is a three-dimensional structure. Anything that happens over here on this right side, for example, is gonna not only pull on just the right side, but it will pull on the whole tailbone, will affect this left side. And oftentimes you will have tension in the front and the right and tension in the back on the left, all kinds of things can happen. The other thing is that, you know, I talk about like the, the uh, pelvic rotation 101 is learning whether or not you're right anterior, you're anteriorly rotated or not. Um, but there can be all kinds of different things that can happen depending on how many different muscles are involved. You can have your pelvis be more rotated in versus out. Your tailbone can be shifted in all kinds of directions. So recognize that this is just like the tip of the iceberg and understanding the alignment of your pelvis. However, it's one of the most common types of rotations and something that you can easily address on your own. So what I would like to do is just demonstrate the supine to sit test. Um, so Jess, if you wanna go ahead and lie on your back. Um, 
you know, uh, Adela was asking about, um, you know, whether or not she could have, she was having increased glute tightness after using the hip hook. And this is like a, a perfect example of how tension in the front of the hip can, can create tension in the back of the hip with that tug of war motion. In fact, many people, while they're using the hip hook, will experience tension in the back of their glute or even their lower back because it is kind of like pulling you out of alignment in a way. It's like if you have a rubber band that's like this and it's tight, it's pulling here and you press in the middle, what's gonna happen? Those two ends are gonna get closer together. So that is a common phenomenon and it's an example of how this whole area is one ecosystem where everything affects everything else. Um, there were a lot of questions around, I know Kim was asking, a lot of questions around do I do just the side that's rotated? Do I do both sides? You know, and I talk about this in the book as well and in our instructional videos, you should absolutely do both sides. You may find you wanna spend more time on one side that particular day, but things will constantly shift where one side will be tighter and then that will loosen up and the other side will be tighter. Also working on your glute using the ball is really important. Even like Damien gave a perfect example. He had, um, he was, his left hip was tight. He was using the hip hook um, three times a week and it reduced his knee pain, um, or actually it was having ankle and foot pain. His ankle and foot pain went away, but then he started getting knee pain on the other side. He's wondering, should I work on the other side? And the question is absolutely yes. This is a perfect example of how that tension can shift over time. So just the point is just check in on both sides of your body each time you use the hip hook. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the supine to sit test. Okay. So supine is a name for lying on your back. Fancy name for lying on your back. <laughs> so when you lie, so in order to do this, this test well, you need to have someone else do it on you. Okay. Um, so Jess is lying down on her back. I want you to bend your knees, Jess, put your feet flat on the ground, and do a little bridge, lift your butt up, come back down. So this just kind of makes sure that her pelvis is nice and level and not, you know, the way she, she was lying down and if it got twisted or something while she did that. So then you go ahead and straighten your legs. <clears throat> I want to look straight down her body. So I want her legs to be straight from her spine. So if her legs are off to the side like this, you know, it's not going to work so well. So I want to make sure that her legs are straight with her body. Then I'm going to use my thumbs to put right underneath her bones on her ankle. So we all have that spot underneath our ankle bone, like a little ledge right here. So that's a great place to kind of find where one side might be lower than the other. So I'm gonna show you some pictures of Jess's feet in just a second, but just to demonstrate the full technique, I got my fingers on that part right underneath her bone, and I'm looking straight down to see whether one finger is higher or lower when she's lying flat. Now this would be the same as she was standing up. If she was standing up, her body is just like this, but upward. <laughs> And that would show also if one leg was longer than the other and standing. So in this particular example with her, and I'll, again, I'll show you the pictures in just a second, her left leg is longer than her right. And I can bring these together and I can see only by looking down, right? You guys can't see, right? And maybe you can, but it's really hard and subtle. It's not like, you know, inches. <laughs> it's more like, you know, maybe half a centimeter or something. So I'm looking straight down, I see that her right leg is longer. And then I'm gonna hold your feet, Jess. I'm gonna have you sit up. And you can use your hands to sit up. You don't have to use your abs like that. That's, <laughs> that's advanced. Um, and she, you can even have your, you know, if your back is hurting or your hips are hurting, you can even do exactly what Jess is doing and, and lean back using your hands. So I'm just gonna do a little pull on her legs, again, making sure that she's all lined up. And I'm gonna do the same thing to look down and see if one is longer than the other. And in this position, they're equal. So her right leg went, was long and it got short, er. 
And so it can go from long to less long. It can go from long to equal, or it can go from long to shorter. It can go from equal to shorter. All of those things are showing that it's going from, it's getting shorter when you go from lying down to sitting up. The leg that gets shorter when you go from lying down to sitting up is the side that's anteriorly rotated. And that is the side that is going to most benefit from the hip hook and the realignment exercise. Now remember, you do the hip hook on both sides, but you probably are gonna have more tension on the side that's anteriorly rotated. And you're absolutely gonna wanna do the realignment exercise only on the side that's anteriorly rotated. Thanks, Jess. <clears throat> so I'm gonna show you um, I'm going to show you some pictures that we took of Jess just earlier today. Um, maybe if I can find them. Let's see. Almost there. Maybe. <laughs> Wait for it. <laughs> there we go. All right. So you can see in this particular example that her left leg is a little bit longer. I'm sorry, her right leg is a little bit longer than her left. It's not by much, you know, it's probably, like I said, about a half of a centimeter, but you can see that the, the top of my thumb on the left, the right side <laughs> is more, um, is lower, further down than the other side. And if I show you what it looked like when she sat up, it got equal. So hopefully you guys can see this and you can see how subtle it is, why it oftentimes takes a trained practitioner to identify this, a chiropractor, physical therapist, or somebody like that. Um, but a lot of times people are really rotated, right? And it's really obvious. Some of you may even know that in yourself. Yeah, I can see that when I'm standing up, one leg is longer. Um, if you have, you are standing and one leg is longer, that leg is probably um, the leg, the longer leg, typically, is the leg that is um, anterior rotated. And, I, and I, I was noticing in some of the comments too that people were talking about how, you know, that there's a three-dimensional structure, there's the sacrum, there's the coccyx, there's all these bones that are responsible for the alignment of the pelvis, and it's absolutely true. There can be issues with all of those areas. Um, but this is just one thing that you can check, a piece of the puzzle that oftentimes um, will give you a clue to what is happening with your body. Okay, so we're at about a um, little over an hour. <laughs> I hope you guys are having so much fun. I am, I'm, I'm so grateful that you're all here. Um, let's see, my suggestion at this point, and I don't know if Kate, um, you have any, any thoughts. Um, my suggestion at this point is that we end the webinar and we plan another time to get together. I am going to spend a lot of time re reading through all your questions and all of your comments so that I can hear directly from you what you're experiencing, which will really help guide me on what kind of content that I create um, on YouTube and Instagram um, and, and what we can do for a further webinar and course for you to give you the exact information that you need. I also just want you to know that our team at Aletha um, is there to support you. If you need anything, feel free to reach out to us. We have many different ways to contact us that you can find on our website. Um, we, we're here for you. We want you to have success in figuring out what's going on with your body and really getting at the core of this issue and, and becoming best friends with your iliacus and getting to know it intimately. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for being here, for participating and sharing 
you know, your personal journeys with me. I, I feel honored to be by your side on your healing journey. So thank you.